Praise God. Father, the thing I pray is that today that you will speak to us. I pray in the name of Jesus that every spirit of rebellion, that every spirit, oh God, of division, that every spirit that would not be the spirit of this house, that it will come under control so that there will not be any conflicting spirit while I preach the gospel in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord Jesus, at the same time that every open heart, every humble heart, and every broken heart will receive this message as the very healing reign of heaven. I pray in the name of Jesus that this environment will now be under control of the power of Almighty God and that there will be a response at the end of this that will be a yes to you, to your purposes, and to your future. And that lives will forever be transformed. We give you all the glory, Lord, all of it, because it already belongs to you. I want you to give your best applause to Jesus right now. Come on. Your best applause to Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to speak to you on the subject, just before you're seated, of a review of our fundamentals, a review of our fundamentals. I'm a, I'm a football coach because that's my hobby. I love it, and I absolutely love kids. And I've moved my office to Evangel because I believe I heard from God. And now that I'm there, I know I've heard from God. We are experiencing a resurgence at Evangel that is unlike anything I've ever seen. There are people that have not been on campus that drive on the campus, get out of their cars. I've seen this happen three times now, three times. Got out of the cars and say, oh, the air is so clear. Things are so fresh. Why? Because God is always doing a greater thing. And God is doing something new and powerful and profound at that school. And being a football coach, one of the things that I can tell you is you don't win games on tricks. You don't win games on smoke and mirrors. You win games on something called fundamentals. Let me say this to you. If your business isn't based on fundamental business principles, your business will fail. It's all about fundamentals. If your marriage is not based on fundamentals, your marriage will be troubled. Until you have the fundamentals, you will not have the foundation. It's the same with our faith, and yet sometimes we don't stop long enough just to go, okay, what are the fundamentals of my faith, and what does God expect? That's what I want to talk about just for a few minutes today. All right? You may be seated. Fundamentals are the foundational biblical truths that we build our lives on. Now, in this context this morning, Fundamentals are at the same time the basic expectations that God has of every believer. How many of you want to know what God expects of you? You know, we're not going to stand before the Lord with our each individualized opinions as to whether or not we did okay. We're going to stand before God and be judged only by His expectations of us. But sometimes... We think God expects things of us that He really doesn't expect. And sometimes God is expecting things of us that we're not even aware of. So we're going to talk about what God expects encased in this title of the fundamentals, our review of the fundamentals of our faith. Um, Hebrews 11 and 6 says this. 
Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now, I like the King James Version of this better because I think biblically it is more accurate. It says, without faith, it is impossible to believe God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He is and that He is the rewarder of those that earnestly seek Him. Here in this passage, we have the most powerful, concise, beautifully put definition of the fundamentals of faith that I have found in the entire Bible. I mean, it's just a short verse, but there is so much in it that when I begin to study, and I plan to use the whole chapter, I couldn't get past the one verse. I said I could preach on that for a month. Don't worry, your roast is not going to burn. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, that He is, and He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Four points today. I want you to write them down. Number one is this. God expects us to believe. Number two, that He is. Number three, that He is the rewarder. And number four, of those who diligently seek Him. If you want to review the fundamentals of your faith, there they are. Let's all stand because I'm through. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> Fundamental of faith number one. God expects us to believe. God expects us to believe. What you'll find is that every principle of God, every fundamental of the faith, is somewhere illustrated in the life and ministry and relationships of Jesus in the New Testament. Why? Because Jesus was the Word made flesh and dwelling among us. Everywhere He went, he was acting out, living out, and demonstrating the principles and the fundamentals of our faith. One of my favorite Jesus and the disciples stories is found in Mark 4.35. Just read along on the screen with me. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side, speaking of the other side of, of the lake. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall, that means a big storm, people, came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. How many of you know that the Son of God could get very tired during the day just like you? To sleep through that kind of storm, the man was very tired. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? What are you doing sleeping? Don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You see, the emphasis of Jesus' rebuke here is still. Still. Do you still have no faith? Are you still worried about that? Really? Are you still stressed about the same things that you were stressed about 10 years ago? Are you still full of fear? Are you still confused? Are you still filled with unbelief? You know, there comes a time in our lives when Jesus says, it's time for you to believe. And I want to declare to you that that time has come. If you've been walking with the Lord for a period of time and you are still not believing, then the word of the Lord, plain and simple to you, is this. It's time for you to believe. 
It's the first fundamental of faith. And I think it's time for us to have a positive confession of our faith, of, of the reason for our faith, of why we believe. I believe we need to hold fast to the confession of the Word of God without wavering. We need to do exactly what the Word of God says. In fact, what we need to do is that we need to put our name in first person in all of these statements about God and His relationship with us and what He's going to do in our lives. I love to do this. God is not a man that He should lie, nor a son of man that He should repent. Has He said and will He not do it? Or has He spoken and will He not make it good? The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for His compassions never fail. I'm a believer. Because they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I will be strong and courageous. I will not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels or demons Neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. We have to come to a place where we understand there are enough promises here that they can moor our faith even in the greatest storm. I'm not discounting the fact that you're going through pain. I'm not discounting the fact that you're going through financial challenges. I'm not discounting the fact that some people have betrayed you and that they're speaking threatening words. I'm not discounting the fact that you got a bad report from the doctor. I'm not discounting the fact that you're having trouble feeding your little children. I'm not discounting the fact that you need a new automobile so bad that you don't even know if yours will make it home today. I'm not discounting the fact that in your heart there is so much strength stress and there's so much pressure that you feel like you're going to implode but I am going to say this to you if you've been walking with God for very long and you have seen his grace and you have seen his power and he has never failed you then it's simply time for you to believe it's time to believe hallelujah you know sometimes your faith has to catch up with your confession I believe that. I believe in the Word of God that says that when you would be afraid, instead you stand. You see, the fact is, sometimes you don't feel like a believer. But you need to confess the truth and not your feelings. Because the feelings you're having, if they contradict the Word of God, are lies. They're lies straight from the pit of hell. And what you need to know is this. When you make the proper confession, your feelings will catch up with your confession. You might be afraid you're going to go bankrupt. But you need to stand up and in a trembling voice, you simply need to say, Lord, I know how I'm feeling, but I know what your Word says. And your Word says, I have been young and now I am old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. And I confess that I have the prosperity of the covenant of God upon me. Hallelujah. Some of you are facing cancer right now, and that word brings terror. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to say this to you. I appreciate the fact that we have examples among us like Darrell Tuberville. Darrell Tuberville went to heaven. God took him home. But I can tell you that he confessed his healing every day of his life till he went. Because the word of God says you never have to be ashamed of hope. Hope never makes you ashamed. And ladies and gentlemen, what you need to do is you need to confess the healing of God over you. You need to curse every cancer cell in your body. You need to curse all of that arthritis. You need to curse every bit of that heart trouble. You need to say, my vascular system works fine in Jesus' name. You need to say, I have been given long life in Jesus' name. You need to say, I'm not going to wake up in the middle of the night concerned anymore about me because God is taking care of every bit of it. He is my healer.
Now, I'm not just speaking to everybody here. I'm not. Because there are some of you that are new Christians and you're still in the battle for your faith. But I can tell you that after those men had walked with Jesus, after they had watched him raise the dead, after they had watched him open blind eyes, after they had watched him as he fed thousands, after they had seen the kind of impact that he had just walking through the streets of the city, after they had watched demons come screaming out of people, Jesus turned to them and with indignation he said, Are you still... People who have trouble believing, are you still full of fear? And I'm not talking to everybody because some of you just got started in this thing. But I am talking to all of you that have been walking with him for years. After you have walked with him for a while, after you've watched him face the giants and defeat them every single time, after you've been ill and you have watched him heal you, after you've been broke and watched him meet your needs a hundred times, after you've grieved over your kids and watched him rescue them, after you've faced him possibilities and watched him do what no man could do after he has washed you with the blood the DNA of the sovereign God and filled you with the Holy Ghost the architect of heaven and earth after he has supernaturally providentially ordered every step after he's called you by his own name and redeemed your life from every curse his fundamental expectation of you is simply you need to believe Hallelujah. <laughs> Fundamental of faith number two. God expects you to believe that he is. That he is. A lot of people believe that just God does. But they don't have the revelation that he is. <sighs> he is. mm 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 you ever walked with somebody for a while who's just committed to being who they are? Come on. They stab you in the back. They betray you. They're one person to your face and another to your back. And what do you say about somebody like that often? Well, that's just the way they are. Well, all I can tell you is this. When you look at your God, everything he does is wonderful. But the reason he does all that he does is because that's just who he is. That's just who he is. My precious children ask me the question, Dad, there are some folks that have wronged you, and you helped them a lot. Said, in fact, Dad, you gave them our stuff. True story. Denny Rodney will testify to this. It wasn't just him that asked this question. There were some others. I've got a lot of them. Some of you think that you got it tough. If I ever do anything questionable, I have to run a gauntlet of eight people. <laughs> the son-in-laws and the daughter-in-laws in that moment are all sympathetic and on my side. Hallelujah. <laughs> Dad, would you do that again? Would you give our stuff to people that betrayed you? Every time, without hesitation, I said, absolutely. Yes, I'd do it again. I said, why? I said, because that's who we are. We're givers. We love to see people's lives grow and evolve and develop. We love to help people achieve their dreams. We love to help them to their next. And the honest truth is, if I allowed people who responded poorly to what we gave to change me, then I've lost the most important thing 
that I could have. And you know what that is? Christ within, which is the hope of glory. But oh, when you begin to know him, to know his character. See, some of you all carried away with the stuff of God. But you don't really demonstrate the character of God because you never really got to know him. Not really. You know all about church. You know all about what your idea of spirituality is. Maybe you even know a lot about the gifts. But the character of Christ has not yet dawned on you. The fact that the greatest power that you will ever know will be the deep well of his character in you. Who he is. Lift your hands all over this place and say, Lord, I want to know you. Say, I want to know who you are. Hallelujah. Every one of us in this place need to come to the conclusion that everything we need is in him. It is in him. And if you want an adrenaline rush of faith, what you need to do is read what God says about himself. You see, because at the very beginning when Moses said, who do I say sent me? God said, tell them I am that I am. I am that I am. If you want to find your spirit soaring, then you need to turn to Isaiah 51 and 2 and declare what he declared about himself. Yes, I am the one who comforts you. So why are you afraid of mere humans who wither like the grass and disappear? Or Jeremiah 23, 23 through 24, I am a God who is near, says the Lord. I am also a God who's far away. Nobody can hide where I cannot see them, says the Lord. I fill all of heaven and earth, says the Lord. Or Ezekiel 12 and 25. For I am the Lord. If I say it, it will happen. Somebody needs to reach up and grab that right now. Malachi 3 and 6. I am the Lord and I do not change. Mark 14 and 62. I am And in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God, the powerful one, and coming on clouds in the sky. John 4, 26. Then Jesus said, I am he. I, the one talking to you. Don't you love that one where he just kind of shakes you by your collar and says, hey, 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 look at me. I am the one you need. I am the Messiah, the one talking to you. John 6, 48, I'm the bread that gives life. If you know that, say amen. In John 8 and 12, he said, I am the light of the world. The person who follows me will never live in darkness, but will have the light that gives life. And John 8, 58, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. Somebody say, I am. And in John 10 and 11, he said, I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. And in John 11, 11 and 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Who believes on me will have life even after they die. In John 14 and 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father is through me. And in John 14 and 11, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or believe because of the miracles I have done. And then in Revelation 1 and 8, the Lord God says, I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the one who is and was and is coming. I am Almighty. And then we see in Revelation 1 and 18, I am the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And in Revelation 3 and 11, I am coming soon. Continue strong in your faith so no one will take away your crown. And in Revelation 21 and 5, the one who was sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this because these words are true and can be trusted. And in Revelation 22 and 
and 20, Jesus, the one who says these things are true, says, yes, I am coming soon. Here's what you got to understand is that from cover to cover in this book, he calls himself I am because he wants you to understand that he doesn't just do good things for you. He is goodness. He doesn't just bring righteousness to you. He is righteousness. He doesn't just bless you with provision. He is the provider. He doesn't just give you healing. He is the healer. You know what a fundamental of faith is? It is when you begin to believe that he is. Hallelujah. He is. Thank you, Lord. Fundamental of faith number three. We must believe that he is the rewarder. It's interesting how these things are separate in the scriptures as if God wants to make sure that you get both principles. He wants to make sure that the new theology doesn't come along and discount the fact that he's a rewarder. Oh, but God doesn't mean that. God doesn't mean that. He doesn't mean that he's going to help you with your house payment. He doesn't mean that he's going to try to help you drive a better automobile. He doesn't mean that he's going to help you kids go to college. That's not what he means. That's not what he means. That's not what the Bible is talking about. You know, the Lord made sure that he made it clear. So he separated it. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and, everybody say and, that he is a rewarder, that he is a rewarder. Amen? I said he is a rewarder. Let me say it over here. I said he's a rewarder. Listen to me. God is a God that wants to help you with your stuff. Even the smallest things, if you include him, you will see his fingerprints all over it. Just the smallest things. You'll see his fingerprints all over it. He is not just the God who is. He is the rewarder. Say that with me. He is the rewarder. Matthew 7, 11, one of my favorite scriptures, it says this. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? God is generous. You serve a generous God. And you need to believe it. Although he is a God who allows the rain to fall on the just and unjust. We do know there are blessings that belong to everybody. Amen. Those who are unrighteous are eating good food today. God came up with all that stuff. Hallelujah. I especially love the way that he created Oreos. Wasn't that a wonderful thing? But what you need to understand is although there are certain blessings of God that belong to everyone, the best blessings that he has are not given indiscriminately. He is a rewarder. A reward is given to somebody who does something. I've got this, if I can get to it. I've got this uh, on my phone here instead of a, because I lose phones. I can't help it. I, I'm just, you know. Phone belongs to Pastor Denny Duran. Cash reward for return of phone if lost. <laughs> Emergency call. I got four numbers there. Now, how many of you understand I am not going to indiscriminately give out rewards. But if somebody brings me my phone, don't any of y'all get an idea down here on the front row? <laughs> they bring me my phone every week, you know. It's like, hey, where's my money? <laughs> well, if somebody brings me my phone, what am I going to give them? I'm going to give them a reward. Now, here's what you have to understand about what this scripture says is that one fundamental number one is you must believe. Number two is you must believe that he is. And number three is you must believe in the reward system that he has set up. 
that he will always reward you when you abide by the fundamentals of faith. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, for instance, um, one of the fundamentals of faith is prayer. One of the fundamentals of faith is fasting. Another one of the fundamentals of faith is giving. And so what you have to understand is this, is that God will reward those who pray. God will reward those who fast. God will reward those who give. You say, well, where is that in the Bible? Well, in the teachings of Jesus. Because Jesus assumed that we would do all of those things. And every time he taught about them, he talked about what the Lord was going to do to reward us. Here's what it says. It says, when you pray, don't pray as the religious people do where everybody can hear them. But go in your closet and pray. And when you have prayed secretly, what does the word say? He will reward you, come on, openly. Then Jesus said this. When you fast, don't fast openly like the hypocrites do. But simply wash your face, put on some good clothes, look like it's every other day. Don't drag around with sunken cheeks and your hair tousled and, and sackcloth and ashes saying, you know, I'm on water only. How about it? No. And, he said, and then Jesus says this, look. He says, when you fast secretly, your heavenly Father will what? Will reward you openly. We're talking about rewards. This is a fundamental of faith. The Lord rewards prayer. The Lord rewards fasting. And then the Word of God says this, when you give. Now, he doesn't say if. He says when you give. You know, there are people that say, I don't go to church because they talk about money. Yeah, because we talk about the Bible. And Jesus, who is the one who got this whole thing together, amen, he is the one that sealed it with his blood and his resurrection, talked about this. And this is what he said. When you give. Somebody say when, not if. Said when you give. Don't do it openly to be seen by men. He said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And he said, when you give secretly, then the Lord will reward you openly. You know, just before church, I called one of my dear friends. He, he has a real prophetic anointing. And the Holy Spirit just prompted me, called Bob Rogers. Well, Bob Rogers has about 19 services a Sunday. So I thought, man, I said, you know, my answer to that prompting was, well, he's going to be in church. Well, I called him, and he answered. Bob answered. Denny, what are you doing? You know, I, I didn't know if he was standing in front of his congregation or what, honestly. But he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm great. I said, but Bob, I said, talk to me about your revelation of God rewarding us. He said, oh, yeah, Denny. He said, this is the way it is. He said, the Lord shared this with me years ago. He said, believers believe, according to Scripture, for a 30-fold, say 30-fold, a 60-fold, say 60-fold, or a 100-fold return. He said, the only way you can get rewarded with a hundredfold return is to look at the ministry of Jesus and see where those rewards are. And he said, if you pray, you'll get a 30%, a 30-fold return, 30 times return. And he said, and that's good. He said, if you fast and pray, it'll be 60. And he said, if you fast and pray and give, he said, it'll be 100. I said, well, talk to me about that. He said, well, every major miracle has those three elements. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. He said, when Jesus divided the fish and the bread, he said, the first thing he said is, I don't want to send them away fasting. He said, so the people were already fasting. He said, then it involved, of course, giving, because the little boy gave his lunch to make that happen. Amen. And then the Word of God says that Jesus prayed over the food. He blessed it, so it involved prayer. And then he gave me another one. He said, over in the book of Kings, he said, there's this story. You want to put that up right now for me, please? 
some, this is the story of Elijah. He had been fed supernaturally by a brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Amen. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Listen. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. And surely, as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. There's the fasting component. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to make, to make home, to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. So here's what happens. Then Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said. But first make me a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. In other words, they were going to do without. And then make something for yourself and your son. All right? For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up. Say the jar of flour. The jug of oil will not run dry. Say jug of oil. Until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So he said to me this morning, he said the three elements are there. He said one is prayer because the lady had obviously been praying because God had heard a prayer. And he was sending Elijah there both to answer her prayer and also to take care of this man of God. He said the fasting element is there, so the humbling of the soul. And he said then, he said, of course, there is the giving because this woman is giving out of her lack. And then he gave me these numbers that blew my mind. He said, what you have to understand is with the three years of famine that were left, he said that's two and a half tons of grain, that's 5,000 meals, and he said that's 1,371 liters of oil. He said, when you talk about a miracle of exponential increase, he said, that is it. Here's what I want to say to you about the fundamentals of your faith. You don't have to get fancy. Just do what you're told. I had a young man come to me this past week, and he's so precious. I just love him with all my heart. And he said this to me, Coach, I want to get on the field so bad, I'll work for it. I'll work for it. I said, Son, you don't have to do anything extra. All you have to do is excel at what we're already doing. I said, I don't need any extra. I just need you to excel at our drills. Excel at what we're already doing. Do you know the fact is that you could enter into a new realm of blessing just by returning to the fundamentals? We're always wanting to know something new. If we could just get something new, we just need a new word. We just need a fresh this. We just need a new that. Folks, let me say this to you. The Word of God is very, very clear. When you go back to the fundamentals of your faith, God will open the windows of heaven and He will begin to bless you like you have never dreamed that you could be blessed. Stand with me, please, all over this place. Amen. How many of you know it's the Word of God? Lord, we thank You for Your Word. Praise the Lord. Now, as your heads are bowed and shut away with the Lord today. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God and that He was raised from the dead? Raise your hand all over this place if you believe that. Keep it up just for a moment, just for a moment. You can put your hands down. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, you'll say, Pastor, I believe that. I believe it. But you'll say, I don't know if I've ever made it official. You say, what are you talking about? Well, you see, in the Old Testament and the New there was only one way that a covenant was made, and that was with people speaking commitments to each other. So when you understand that covenants were made through statements, then you understand the instructions of salvation. Because salvation happens when you do believe that Jesus is the only Son of God and raised from the dead. So you have half of it but salvation only is completed in your life when you make covenant with God so you have to speak your intention to God even as he's spoken his intention to you and until you speak it covenant is not made there were no covenants ever made in the Word of God without God speaking 
and man speaking in agreement. You understand? So you say, you mean I've been this close all these years and I didn't even understand that? Absolutely. And the devil has come in and confused some of you and said, don't do that because you'll be a hypocrite. No, you won't. You won't. You'll be a Christian. And then God will help you with all of those things. It's like somebody saying, you know, I'm not going to move this load of dirt out of my driveway until I get strong enough to move it by myself. And right next door, there's a guy that has a little piece of machinery that could scoop it up in two trips. But you're not going to ask him because even though I know I can never get it on my own, I, let me say something to you. That's the way some of you are approaching your commitment to God. That stuff that's in your life, you can't move it. But if you receive Him, He'll help you move it. That addiction, He'll help you break it. But you can't do it by yourself. And it's silly for you to think, well, I'm going to be a hypocrite if I make this statement. No, you're not. Because you're not making a commitment to be perfect. You're not even making a commitment to be good. You're, you're making a commitment to love God and let Him change you from the inside out. That's all you're doing. That's it. So right now, all over this place, on the count of three, if you'll say, Pastor Denny, I believe exactly what you said. Jesus is the only Son of God, and He was raised from the dead. I believe it. I believe it with everything in me. And you'll say, if what you're saying is true, that I should go ahead and I should make the covenant by saying it to him today. And I should get him. Listen to this. Here's what's crazy. Do you know that covenants were recorded for the protection of both parties, even in ancient times that covenants were recorded? Do you know what the book of life is? That's all it is. It's the recording of a covenant. Shreveport, Louisiana, August 26th, 2018. Joe was sitting there. It dawned on him. He was already a believer. He believed that Jesus is the only Son of God. And he made a covenant with me. And he goes, Write that down, angel. Record it. The covenant is recorded. Okay, you ready? On the count of three, if you'll say, I don't know if I've made a covenant with God, you'll say, but I'm ready to make a covenant. It's not a covenant that you're going to be able to keep laws and be good and be righteous and change. It's not that. If He can't change you from the inside out, then I promise you, you'll never change. All you're going to do is give Him a chance to change you from the inside out. But you will always be in covenant with Him because today the covenant is going to be recorded. Glory to God. Isn't that exciting? Right now, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. When I count, if you'll say, that's me, I'm ready to make that covenant standing right where I am. I want you to raise your hand up. Because why? Because the Word of God says that if we are not ashamed of Him on the earth, He will not be ashamed of us in heaven. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Raise your hand all over this place. I'm not sure I've made that covenant, but I'm ready to make that covenant. Raise your hand all over this place, all over this place, all over this place. Look at all the hands. Somebody give the Lord praise for what He's doing here in this place. Isn't that exciting? Hallelujah. Listen to me. Let's pray this prayer. We're going to all pray it with you. You see what happened is we all made a covenant to it one time and got recorded. Hallelujah. Because we're going to get so excited about your name being written in the book of life right now. The record of this covenant is being made as we speak. Somebody give the Lord praise for that. Hallelujah. Right now, I want you to lift your hands all over this place. And I want you to pray this prayer. Jesus Christ. I enter into covenant with you. I thank you that this is a one-sided covenant when it comes to payment. Because you paid your part and you paid my part. So I come to you and I thank you 
that you are the only Son of God. I declare it with my mouth and that you are raised from the dead and that you are alive today. And from this moment on, I declare that I am Christian, that I am a believer, and I belong to you. In Jesus' name, give the Lord praise. Thank you for joining us. We hope this message has equipped and encouraged you. For current events and other resources, visit ccpeople.com. And remember, the best is yet to come.